All right, uh, welcome to, well, this pretty much the start of the spring semester. See, that's all I have to do is I have to start. And uh, this is CST8250, uh, Introduction to Database Design and Data Server Man Database Administration. Um, so I'm gonna talk about myself for a minute. And um, this is just the course overview at first, and then we'll dive into the first lecture. All right, so I'm a college graduate, not a university graduate. Um, I graduated in 96 from Canador College. It's probably most of you in here probably don't know where that is unless you know where North Bay is. Um, that's fine. Um, I've been working at as professional developer since, well, pretty much professional developer ever since unemployed for a grand total of three weeks in, you know, since 96. So been a busy boy. I work full time and I teach part time. So what does that mean? Um, it means that I have current industry experience. I have not atrophied into the education system. Um, I also, because I teach part time, I also make sure that my labs are as clear as they can be and straightforward enough. Uh, what am I doing right now? I'm actually a team leader. I just bit, got made a team leader uh, with one of the data analytics teams at Health Canada. Um, so I was 26 years before that in the private industry, uh, mostly a full stack web developer um, with a side of AWS administration. So essentially the program you're in, I did for a living for a long time. So what kind of person am I? Um, well, those that have already met me in one of the labs are probably got a good feel of what kind of person I am already, but um, I tend to have a fairly loose and easygoing teaching style. I do not have notes. Why? Because I've been doing this for so long that I know the material. The notes are the slides. Um, I tend to understand that life happens. People get sick, you know, dogs eat your laptop. Dogs pee on your laptop after they ate it. Um, yes, I've seen it with photographic evidence. Um, cool, you know, things happen. Uh, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, but by the same token, if your laptop gets eaten for the fourth time in a row by your dog, I'm going to stop having any kind of sympathy. So, you know, you can only, you know, make it for so long. Um, I've been told I lack political correctness and I've been known to roast my students in class. Um, foul language will probably happen. I'm sorry now. Um, one of the joys of working for a living, uh, you tend to develop certain speech habits. Um, but that's, you know, you'll get used to it when you go to the industry anyways, so might as well get used to it now. It's not, I'm not a sailor. It's not that bad. Okay. So what are some of the best practices for success? Okay. At, attend the lectures and the labs. I'm going to put a caveat on that right now. Because I that first line is there because I have to put it there, just, just so you know. Yes, I want you to come to lecture. It's your best chance to ask questions. If you are sick, don't come and lick your classmates. Like seriously, just don't do it. Um, I'm recording the lecture. There's a reason I do that. Um, one, the reasons I do it is I tend to speak quickly and for people where English is not your first language, you'll miss stuff occasionally. And unfortunately I've tried to slow down. I've been trying to slow down for 17 years now. It's not working. Um, mind you, if I'm going a bit fast in class, you raise your hand, get my attention, tell me to slow down and I'll slow down for about 30 seconds but I will do my best to be reasonable. Um, the other reason I record is if you're sick, you're not gonna miss on lecture material. Uh, normally the recordings will be posted same night, next day. I'm in class till 10 tonight, so I'm not sure if it's gonna be a uh, same day lecture posting this semester, uh, but I'll try my best. Um, so the course moves fairly quickly. Uh, the way it's organized, it's literally one topic per lecture with no overlap. 
if at all possible. Um, so again, I record my lectures. So even if you miss a class, you're not going to miss the content. Um, you know, if things are going to go horribly wrong for you, and you're going to miss like a week of school, just send me an email. Don't email me four weeks later saying, oh, I didn't do any work for the last four weeks. I was kind of sick. It's a little hard to retroactively, you know, take away zeros. Um, keep up with the reading material. Everything for the course is on Brightspace. There is no textbook. Um, and there it says there's a free PDF version of the textbook. Uh, it's been acquired with permission posted on Brightspace. Technically, the textbook I wrote 12 years ago, and one of the other profs put that line in these slides because they asked me if they could use it. Um, it's just there, it's no longer there, there as a single textbook, it's sliced up. Um, check Brightspace regularly because I put out an announcement every week on what you should be working on, what is due, um, that kind of stuff. So you have no excuse to not know what's coming. Uh, complete the labs. So labs are due by the end of the following week. So any lab assigned this week is due next Friday. So that means you have roughly a week and a half to do the labs, except labs one through five or one through six have already been made available to you. So you know what la the labs are because they're already visible to you. Um, so I'll accept with late labs up to one week. You'll take a small penalty on it. Anything more than a week? Goose egg, zero. Um, when you go out into the real world and you have to explain to your client why you're late, it doesn't go well, especially if you're working in private industry. I'm gonna treat you guys to the same standard. Um, also labs are a great way to test your learning, you know. Um, always ask questions, studying groups whenever possible and practice. Oh, and be on time to class. Because I will call you out every single time you are, if you're more than five minutes late. I've had a case where I had a group of students that were chronically late, got to the point where the whole class class was clapping when they arrived. Then they stopped coming to class, which was just as good. All right, so what are you gonna be learning? Week one, introduction to database modeling and database design. Like literally, as soon as I finish this introductory set of slides, we're gonna start taking in content. Uh, week two, normalization. And this is where I'm gonna put a little uh, aside for you guys. Um, I've rejigged the course content this semester. Um, I've been teaching this course on and off for over 10 years. And as of last semester, I got tired of the slide deck we had because it was literally the exact same slide deck I created over 10 years ago with just, it was uglified by other people. And I realized that some of the content was out of date and it was actually, some of the concepts were hard to cover in the order they were in. So I've rejigged it. Um, so if you go looking at the YouTube channel where all my lectures get posted, you'll know it. If you look back at the old version of this course, you'll notice that the content's not in the same order. That's why I'm putting in that note. Uh, so week two, normalization. Uh, normally the hardest topic of the semester. We're gonna get it over with right at the beginning. So while everybody's brains are still fresh and functional. Uh, three, uh, diagrams. Week four, uh, physical database design process, which will also cover more diagrams. Uh, week six, the midterm review. Week seven, midterm in class. Week eight, we all pretend to not have school. Uh, week nine, uh, backup and restore. We're, so the first half is all about design. Second half is all about administration. Backup and restore. Week 10 is database security. Week 11 is triggers. Week 12 is store procedures and functions. Uh, honestly, week 11 and 12 are some of my favorite topics. Um, week 13 will be transactions. And then a final review and then the exam, whenever they happen to schedule it, wherever they schedule it.
<clears throat> All right, so how are your grades going to be broken down? So labs are worth 40% of your grade. In actual fact, I forgot to update the slide. There's now nine labs, not 10. Um, specifically, I combined labs nine and 10. You're going to have a midterm worth 25% of your grade. There are hybrids um, worth 10%. So what used to happen was there was labs, a midterm, and a final exam, and that was it for grades. I resurrected the hybrids. Somewhere along the way, in the last 10 years, when one of the other profs took over this course, they took out the hybrids, which was cool. That means the students had less work to do, which also meant the students had fewer places to get grades. Right? You get sick, you miss four labs, you're toast, kind of thing, right? So at least the hybrids give you a chance to reduce the cost of the labs because it used to be the labs were worth half your grade. Um, and then the final exam for 25%. The, so in regards to the labs, there's nine, not 10. Um, I even took the time to update the, the aside, but I forgot to update the number in the table. Uh, lab nine is worth a little bit more because it covers more material than the other labs because it's literally lab nine, lab 10 combined. Um, therefore, it's going to be worth more points. It's just what would happen historically. The students would do lab nine and 10 at the same time and then just submit both. Therefore, I, I'd say, what, what's the point of having two separate labs for that? So let's put them together so everybody gets it at the same time. Okay. So this course is a three to four course. Um, so what does that mean? That means you have technically scheduled three hours of theory, two hours in class, an hour online, also known as hybrid. Uh, two hours of lab and four hours of study time, depending on who you are. Four hours might be more than enough. Four hours might not be enough. That number's kind of fuzzy. Um, and now for the two hours in class for the theory, I try to keep my lectures to an hour and a half instead of taking a break in the middle and everybody goes away for 20 minutes and then everybody keeps coming in late for the second half of the lecture. I tend to go for an hour and a half and everybody just gets to leave. It's more um, consistent that way. All right. Now, I am going to dive into... Brightspace just for a moment so that you guys can see where things are happening in here. Um, you guys know what Brightspace looked like by now, semester two. I hope you know what Brightspace looks like. So under the content, you'll see that my shell is actually very sparse compared to some of the other courses. Um, this is the teacher's view, by the way, so everything is visible to me. Some of you will have less items in here. Uh, under the course info, you've got the CSI, or I guess they call it something else now, but the CSI, uh, information about me. Um, and some policies that by now you should have read at least once. Um, essentially, cheating and plagiarism. And, you know, uh, lecture materials all under lectures. All the lectures are there. Uh, labs are all going to be in here. Um, recordings, when they show up, will be here. And uh, the hybrids, which is the thing I've just brought back. The hybrids are visible. The one hybrids one through five are visible to you guys now, at least. And essentially it, the concept is there is a PDF you read, you take a quiz. You get two kicks at the quiz, it keeps the best score. And the quiz is random. And the questions come out of a pool. So that means the second time you do it, you may not get the same questions. And they're shuffled. So, you know. I'm trying to give you guys the, you know, actually make you think a little bit, not do it once, then just do it a second time after you know what the questions are. Yeah, obviously, there's not enough questions to make it completely unique for everybody in the class, but, you know, I'm trying, okay? Um, so when it comes down to what's going to be on the tests, um, it'll be the lecture slides plus the PDFs from the hybrids. So those are your two sources of official. If it's not in either of those two sets of documents, it's not on the test. Okay. I am not going to test you guys on things I say in class that are not written down somewhere. I hate that. 
hated it as a student. And I hated it as a prof because it always blows up in our face. So if it's not written somewhere in Brightspace, it's not going to be on a test. Is that fair? Okay. Good. Okay. Um, now I'm going to go with the lab attendance. I don't take an attendance in lab. You come if you need help. Everything is good. You don't need to come. All the work is submitted on Brightspace. There's no demos. There's no lab exam. There's no practical exam. Which is going to make this 8 o'clock lab tonight really sparse. Um, so make sure you come at the start of the lab. Because if I sit in the room by myself for half an hour, I'm leaving. You know. Um, I, You know, I'm just being completely honest here. It's, I'm not going to sit around waiting for people to maybe, maybe magically show up. Um, so the first class with you guys is in, uh, oh heck, what room are we in? No, not right now. I know where I am now. Yeah, so A2, uh, A211 is the first group. Oh yes, that's right, it's this room where we're cooking to death yeah, on Tuesday. Um, and then the other room is in J210. Now, what's kind of cool is I'm in J210 from uh, 6 to 10 tonight, except at 6 o'clock is a different course. However, odds are most of the time those guys will be done under an hour, so you might be able to just slip in if you need help and so you can go home earlier. Just please don't do that for like the first two weeks so that, you know, people don't feel stressed about suddenly more people walking in that they don't recognize. Um. But in theory, you should be able to slip in if you want to come in early for questions. That way, you know, you get to go home earlier. And I know for a fact, originally, you guys were scheduled for 7, not 8. But then they changed our, my schedule and slipped the class between the two. So it is what it is. All right. So without further ado, we're going to dive into today's content. Unless somebody has any questions. Does anybody have any questions before I proceed? Yeah. Well, it's just the th th the other choice is tonight at eight o'clock. There's only two lab sections. Yeah, that's why you can't. You know, you you know how in access sometimes you can change what your lab sections are. Once you hit level two, there's a reason why they won't let you this semester. Yep. Uh, but yeah. You're, you know, there's not much I can say about that. Any other questions? In theory, after a few weeks, you'll be able to move around, but if you're in class till 9.30, you're all your SOL. Well. Um, any other questions before I dive into today's content? Going once, going twice, going three times. Okie dokie. Unless you're having problems. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, so far, one Windows user has had a problem and seven Mac users have had problems. Apple likes making things hard. And Oracle is doing a great job making it harder. <laughs> the labs are help sessions. There is no, we're not allowed, okay. I don't know if you've had this other profs do it to you where they cover new material in the labs. They're not supposed to. Be unless it's your lecturer that also covers all the lab sections, which doesn't happen very often. They're they're not supposed to cover new material in lab. You know, our chair has already come down several times on our lab profs for doing that. Because what happens is, let's just say, in this case, it'd be fine, quote, quote, fine, because I'm, you know, teaching both lab sections. But if I had somebody else was teaching one of the lab sections, and I covered material, the other prof might not cover it. Therefore, suddenly there's an inconsistent learning within a group or across multiple sections when there's, you know, the computer programmer, the CET students, you know, 
You guys have one section of this. Their level two database course, there's five sections. There's a lot more of them. Uh, so, you know, there's no new material in labs at all. So this is it. This is where content is delivered onto, your, onto you. Okay. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about data and what the fundamental database objects are when you're doing database design. So I'm gonna discuss what data information is. I'm gonna talk a small intro about the design process. And then I'm gonna talk about the fundamental database objects that you have when you are uh, talking about the design process. I know you guys have already had a level one database course, so you know what a table is, you know what a row is, you know what a column slash field is. It's all good. So what is data? It's a thing, literally, it's a thing. Specifically, it's a thing that someone wants to keep track of. And some people wonder why do you use the word thing? Because there's no other way to describe it. In French, it being shows, something we want. It's a thing. Because a thing, it could be a person, could be a desk, could be an event, could be the weather. It's just something that needs to be tracked. It can be almost anything that is describable. And sometimes some people come up with stuff that's not describable that I want to keep track of. So, as I said, it could be a person, an event, an object. Uh, those are most of the major things we collect when we talk about data. Because um, usually we collect data about people, students, for example, right? You're all a thing as far as computing is concerned. Um, events, a class, you're attending a class, it's an event. An object, you're sitting in a classroom, therefore there's an object involved in all of this. All right, so data versus information. So it all starts out as unorganized information, also known as data in a raw state. Essentially, we are just trawling the world for information. Basic weather information, basic information about people, um, you know, just stuff. Then it gets transformed into a proper structure inside of a database server, it's organized information derived from structured data. So essentially what happens is it goes from unorganized info into data and then becomes organized information. So that's, that's the transition of how the data transforms through its life cycle. It is a um, interesting process, to say the least. Um, it is one of the most organic processes in computing. Because, you know, you hear the term computer science, right? And usually science means there's a set way of doing certain kinds of pieces of work. You need to do a loop. How many ways are there to do a loop? You got a for loop, you got a do loop, and you got a while loop. They, all three of them do something slightly different, but you have three ways to do a loop. You need to check a conditional. What do you have? If and case, right? There's not a lot of variation when it comes to programming. It's how you put it together. It's like Lego. The issue with data and information is it's subjective. Every person sees something different. Um, I used to do this exercise and then I actually forgot it at home. I used to bring in this really abstract picture and I asked like four people, what do you see? And I guarantee it was four totally different answers. Why? Because a person's um, perspective will color what they see. So how do we avoid some of that? So we try to figure out, we try to organize our data. So we organize data by proper planning, doing proper database design, and we normalize. Uh, the database design involves three sets of diagrams. 
um, the conceptual, logical, and physical diagrams, we are going to learn about most of this this semester. So the database design process has five steps, at least. Step one, you identify. You try to identify um, the things you're trying to collect information about. So not only are you coming up with a concept, we also identify the pieces that make up this concept. Have you ever given thought about how complicated student data is? I usually, usually students come in, they have no idea how complicated their data is. Let's think about this for a second. All right, so we're gonna identify a student data. When we think about student data, we have, well, the student, right? We have courses, right? We have sections for the courses. We have programs. We have profs. We've got classrooms. We've got schedules, right? People don't think about just how much is involved. Like, oh, yeah, no problem. I'm just want to change my schedule. No. There's so many things that are being moved around, and we need to keep track of all of it. So what we end up doing is we try to identify all the big objects as much, we identify it as much as we can. Then we do a step called normalization, which is what we're gonna learn next week. Normalization is a process of making your data be safe. Not safe in the sense of safe from someone stealing it from you, safe from corrupting itself. Because if you don't design your data properly, it's actually liable to self-corruption. Um, then we'll do a conceptual diagram. In other words, we draw a simple diagram to make sure we actually understand it. I will go from conceptual to a logical slash physical diagram. You'll notice in this in this slide that I've got them put together because they're almost the exact same thing. Just tiny little difference between them. Then you do a review. And if you're lucky, you can do a peer review. That means you get a second set of eyes to check your work. And then you take the results of your review and you identify your deficiencies are and you start all over again. Sounds familiar if you've learned anything about the software development life cycle. The database, you know, development life cycle is very similar. Oh boy, that was slow. So identification is known as defining the data sources. Literally, like I just went through the exercise of let's identify what makes up a student information system. And that's, you know, student information, names, addresses, that kind of thing. Then we have, um, sometimes we have to identify the data sources, not just what we're trying to collect. And there's usually a couple of different places data comes from. You may have an existing database. For example, uh, Canada publishes a lot of their data for free. You can go to the StatsCan website and download whole chunks of data from somebody else's data structures. The data structures are pretty terrible, but they're data structures. It might be you're inheriting a CRM system. It could be any of those things. And you might be doing a clean room implementation. Clean room implementation has the most flexibility, but also the biggest risk of missing something. Why? You're starting from scratch. You have nothing no sources of data, nothing. Basically, your boss went out for a week, comes back, and I go, I have a dream. And I don't know if anybody here's ever worked with that kind of a boss that comes back with all kinds of new ideas every time they go out of town for a week. Um, it's not a good time. But it's sometimes the most fun because you're not constrained by, you know, specific needs. But by the same token, because you don't have an example, it's easy to miss stuff because, well, you miss stuff. Um, sometimes you're gonna digitize existing processes. This is something you don't see as much anymore uh, because most companies who are trying to do data collection will digitize it right off the bat. They'll you know, create a, a survey that collects the data. Uh, they will 
um, you know, set up a website that collects data, that kind of stuff. But every once in a while, you'll come across something where paper's still being used. And that's called digitizing an existing process. During the 80s and early 90s, that was a really big part of the industry, where companies were migrating from paper-based to electronic. Anybody here ever work in accounting? No? Okay. Well, if you've, I was going to say, if you've ever worked on an accountant, you know how much they love their paper. Everything gets printed. And everything is tracked on paper. Um, and uh, they're the biggest source of having to digitize stuff. And then there's other sources. I mean, creativity can come from anywhere, right? But usually the first three are the big ones. All right. So now we're going to talk about the fundamental fundamental database objects. So like I said earlier, you guys know about tables. You guys know about columns or fields. But before it becomes those things, there's fundamental objects that exist before that. The tables and the columns and the rows and, you know, the, the actual referential integrity that's put into the database, that's known as the physical design of the database. That's the end step. When you're doing the initial database design, we have three objects. Entities, also known as things. Attributes, which we use to describe them. And relationships, and how are they interconnected. Now, the entities, um, how many of you, uh, when I know you've started, you took started Python last semester. Did they do object-oriented Python with you guys yet? Or just regular Python? Just regular Python. Okay. So if I talk about classes and properties, it probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you guys, right? Okay, good. I don't have to go use that analogy. Um, with the CP and CET students, I have to use that analogy because they program in Java. So it makes more sense in that way. Okay, so an entity becomes a table. An attribute becomes a field or a column. The relationship, well, becomes a relationship. <laughs> it's, you know, that, that, that one stays the same. All right. Entities. <clears throat> Entities are the fundamental objects in database design. They describe the items you are trying to maintain information about. So, earlier we were talking about um, the student information. Therefore, entities that we're trying to keep track of would be students, courses, schedule, like schedules, sections, that kind of stuff. Each of those things would be an entity in the database. Um, sometimes you'll come across the phrase entity class. Um, an entity class is just shortened to entity, so I'll just be using the phrase entity. Uh, it's just, if you go Googling for some of this stuff, every once in a while you'll see them use the phrase entity class, because that's the old term that they used to use in the 1970s. And some people just keep using it, but we've all shortened it down to entity. Um, an entity eventually becomes a table in the database. All right, so, so far, you guys roughly understand what an entity is? Right, it's a thing, right? It's a table in your database. An instance, is a row of data. Right. So an entity instance is a single row, would map out to what's a row in the database. So it's, if we talk about an entity as in a student, like, you know, the entity is student, each of you are an instance of the entity. Which is why it comes back to the whole, you know, did you guys learn about object orientation yet? Because you'd all be, you know, an instance of that object. But in this case, you're all an instance of the student entity. And usually the instance becomes a row. Now, in a moment, I'm going to talk about attributes. But essentially, every entity is described the exact same way. The information contained in that description will be different but it's described the exact same way. All right, so an entity is described by attributes. I'll be talking about those in a moment. 
Examples, student, course, and locker. Every instance of a given entity will always have the same attributes. The values can vary. For example, a specific student. Each of you have a different name. Each of you have a different student number. Each of you have a different phone number, most likely. Um, a specific course, a specific locker, that kind of thing. And we have two kinds of entities. We have strong entities. So a strong entity is an instance of data that can exist by itself. It needs nothing else to define it. A good example of a strong entity is a customer record in a database. We have a customer. The customer can exist in the system. Yes, it might get some values from other places, but as a whole, the customer exists by itself. It doesn't need anything else to define it. Just like each student in this room, you are all strong entities as far as the school system is concerned because you can exist in Access without anything else. But as long as it can exist with anything else, without anything else, that means it's a strong entity. We have weak entities. So data instance, that first sense is broken. All right, so essentially a weak entity is a piece of data that cannot exist without something else defining it. A good example is a payment on a loan. For example, a loan is a strongish entity. The bank has it, it exists by itself, more or less. A payment, on the other hand, cannot exist without a loan. Can you imagine you walk into the bank one day and you go, take my money. For what? I want to pay a loan. What loan? I don't have a loan, but take my money. It makes no sense. It cannot exist without a loan. It needs something to define its existence. It's a bit like, you know, that person that always needs a significant other to actually mean something. It's, that's a weak entity. It needs something else to help define its existence. So that's a weak entity. All right, so we know what a strong entity is. We know what a weak entity is. Now we need to describe said entity. So attributes describe an entity. It will usually become a field or column in a database. Sometimes we drop some of these attributes because we don't need to keep them. Um, I'll explain uh, later on in the course what, when those things happen. During the design phase, the conceptual design phase, attributes do not have specific data types. We don't care what the data looks like. We just want to know what makes up the data. Um, so during the physical design phase, attributes could be split up, combined, or even dropped out. Um, these actually have all specific kinds of names, and we will cover those in week three. However, using the students again as an example, some attributes that define a student. Student number. First name, last name, or given in family name, or whatever. Uh, date of birth, address, phone number, um, potentially your social insurance number if you're a Canadian, or your passport number, or your student visa number if you're an um, international student. There's, these are all attributes that define a student, the, the master record of a student. Now, the thing is that all of you share the exact same attributes. It's just your Individual values are different. So you're a student, you're a student, you're a student. I don't know any of your names, by the way, so you know. So we got Jane, Bob, and Frank. Sorry, I just don't know your names. And I probably will never remember your names because I suck with names. But you know, you've got names. Everybody has a name. They're and almost everybody has a last name. Unless you're from India, then you have a period according to Access. I'm just, they started laughing because at least there's three people in here that don't have a last name in Access. So they put in a period. Cultural differences. Um, but everybody has names. Everybody has a date of birth. Man, I hope you have a date of birth. 
Because if you don't have a date of birth, you came from somewhere weird. You know, they put the put down, you know, um, your phone number. Most people have a cell phone. You may not have a cell phone. You might have a home phone number. Personal email address, school email address. Mailing address versus currently residing address. Because some people, their mailing address is somewhere else. Because their you know, mail goes to their house where they grew up or whatever, and that while they're living in an apartment or in residence, right? So you got your current living address versus your mailing address. You all have the same attributes, just the values being plugged into each of those attributes is different. Um, sometimes we have attributes that are multiple things put together. Um, those are known as compound attributes. Those would be, for example, your address. As humans, our brains automatically translate what the word address means, right? What makes up an address? Anybody want to chirp up? There's no wrong answer. Okay. Province, postal code, right? That's what makes up an address. You tell the computer, this person has an address. The computer doesn't know what you're talking about. He says it's an address, so he thinks it's one thing. Realistically, it's one thing made up of a bunch of small things. Later on, these will be broken apart. Sometimes we'll actually go the opposite and combine them. So attributes are interesting because they let you describe things. So there's a few different kinds of attributes. We have identifiers. These are the kind of attributes that are used to potentially identify something uniquely identify something. Remember last semester, probably learned about something called primary keys, right? Select from a table by the primary key. That at some point was an identifier before it became a key. Common identifiers. You all have multiple identifiers. So what's your identifier when you think about Algonquin? There we go, student number. Uh, if you are a Canadian citizen and born in Canada, you probably have a birth certificate number. If you are allowed to work in Canada, you probably have a social insurance number because you can't have you can't have a job without a you know some sort of sin number. Um, unless you're working cash. Email address sometimes could be an identifier. You know, it can be a bunch of things. It's basically piece of data could be used to uniquely identify something. We have atomic attributes. These are attributes that contain only a single value. Date of birth. Yes, a date is made up of multiple pieces, but it's a date. It's one thing. Another one would be a postal code. That's one thing. An email address is one thing. Those are atomic values. You have composite attributes, which I just spoke about. Those are um, things like street addresses. We have multi-valued attributes. These ones are the hard ones to deal with. It's a list of values. So if I look at one of you and I go, what skills do you have? So in theory, you could have an attribute called skills, and you just list off every skill a person has in it, right? That's known as a multi-valued attribute where we have one entity that has, or one attribute that has multiple values inside of it. Multiple values of the same kind of thing. Um, those are a big no-no, by the way. Uh, that's like one of the first things we get rid of when we're going through the design process. We have derived attributes. Derived attributes are interesting. We store our date of birth. But we don't need to store an age, because age is derived. You take the current date minus the person's date of birth, and that tells you how old they are. Yeah, date math really sucks, but that's essentially how you do the math. I can hear what you're saying up front. Your voice carries really well. Thank you. So you have other ones would be a line total. 
a line total is a derived attribute. For example, you go to the store and you're going to go buy some bananas. Okay? You buy one and a half kilos of bananas. Or actually, let's go with three pounds of bananas because all our weights in, are always in pounds for some unknown reason. So you buy three pounds of bananas at 79 cents a pound. Your line total would be three times 79 cents. You can calculate it. So a derived attribute is an attribute that can be calculated using other data in the same entity or even elsewhere in the database. So it's derived because we can math it. Names, addresses are not derived because you can't math a name. There's no calculation to calculate somebody's name. But an age you can calculate. Person's GPA you can calculate. And then we have optional attributes. Optional attributes could be any of the above, but that are not necessarily required to define an entity. So for example, I don't even know if you even still see this on the student registration forms, but I guarantee in Access, because I saw it recently, there's still a fax field. How many of you know what a fax is? I feel old. It's a fax machine where you used to send basically photocopies over the phone line to, to describe it for people. You took a picture and it then transmitted it over the phone line. And then they'd receive it. It's still very popular in Japan, apparently. Um, and a lot of lawyers still use them because apparently a fax is a safe, secure documentation transmission process. Which it's not. But, you know, it's legal. So a fax number, for example, would be an optional attribute. You don't need it to define someone. It's just nice to have. Or not anymore, but you know, at one point it was nice to have. So that's an optional attribute. And actually, we already went through this. So, you know, examples of attributes when we talk about a student, you know, student number, their name, their address, which happens to be composite, date of birth, age which is derived. Those are examples of the different kinds of attributes you'd use on a student. All right, now for relationships. So you guys are learning about relational database systems, you know, last semester and this semester. Relationships is what caused that name for a product to exist. Um, in the 1970s, um, a data scientist by last name of Chen, another one by last name of Cod, and there's a fellow called CJ Date. Basically all got together in separate places. I'm probably faxing stuff to each other. Um, they were basically coming up with the concepts of relational database systems on how do you relate data to each other. Did you have a question? I just saw your hand sort of up. Um, you don't have to hide your hands. It's just, you know, for a little bit, it looks like you had a question there. Um, so, so when you talk about relational databases, that's where it comes from. It's the relationships. And the relationship defines how one entity is connected to another entity. So, An example of one of these connections would be prof to student, right? And there's three kinds of relationships, one-to-one, -one, one to many, and the, the, the version that comes from Kentucky, the many-to-many, -many, where everything is related to everything else. Um, man, the international students never get that joke. Sorry. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about the three kinds of entities, uh, relationships, I mean. Um, so a one-to-one -one relationship, it's not a common type of relationships. It's a perfectly valid type of relationship. Essentially, every entity is participating in a one-to-one -one relationship only has a single connection to another entity. For example, student and locker. How many of you have lockers? Well, thank God there's at least one this semester. My last semester, last my last spring semester, there was no students that had, out of two lectures, actually had a locker. Like, why would I want to pay for that? It's nice out. Okay. 
So student and locker. When you sign up for a locker, how many lockers are you allowed to sign up for? One. How many people can sign up for that locker? One. Therefore, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. They're both strong entities. They can both exist without a locker, obviously. Look at this room. Student, lots of students in here exist without a locker. And do the lockers out in the hall stop existing if a student doesn't sign up for it? All right, so they're both strong entities that have a one-to-one -one relationship. Each student's allowed to have one locker. Each locker's allowed to have one student. Yeah, I've seen people pile a bunch of stuff in the locker, sharing a locker, but there's only one person that actually owns that locker. So one-to-one. -one. That one's easy. All right, one-to-many. So in most relational database systems, one-to-many is the most common type. This relationship is also often called parent-child, and I've also seen master detail. Um, so essentially a given entity, the parent, can be related to many other entity instances, the child of a different entity. Um, for a quick example, we're going to go with goose and egg. A goose can lay many eggs, but that egg can only ever come from one goose. We're not talking about whether or not the egg is fertilized. We're talking about what shot it out. So each egg can only ever come from one goose, but that goose can shoot eggs out all day. So that's a one-to-many relationship. Another example would be going to the grocery store. And we all go to the grocery store, or at least we all eat. And when you go to the grocery store, you put stuff in your shopping cart, you check out, you get a receipt. You have one receipt for all the things you bought. You might, you might have only bought a bag of chips. You might have bought a week's worth of groceries, but you have one receipt and one to many items, items related to it. Master detail, once again, or, you know, parent, child. The receipt's the parent. The stuff in your car is, or your on the your bags on the bus is, the child records. And then we get the fun one. Many to many. So it's also a very common type of relationship in design. However, many to many relationships can only ever exist during the conceptual stage. Database, actual database software like, you know, MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, do not allow the creation of many-to-many -many relationships. It's a concept. We have, you'll learn later in the semester how to resolve these relationships. So this happens when you have two entities where they can be related to each other multiple times. So we have two entities, students and course. Each student can be enrolled in multiple courses, right? Each course can have multiple students. Therefore, it's a many-to-many -many relationship. For example, CST 8250 24S has whatever number of students that actually show up on time for class. Man, he showed up just in time to actually end the class. Class is over in like 10 minutes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, see previous statement about roasting. Um, so each course has many students in it, and I'm sure most of you have more than one course, right? Therefore, it's a many-to-many -many relationship where there's many students in this class, and you guys go to many classes. Profs have a many-to-many -many relationship with the students also. I have many students, and you guys have many profs. Usually, it's one prof per course, but, you know, it happens where you get split courses where you have multiple profs. So that's a many-to-many -many relationship. Later on, those have to be resolved because they physically cannot exist in a real database system, an actual, you know, server.
But as a concept, it's totally understandable. Uh, there's other examples of it in the real world. Um, you know, you have uh, many products on the store shelf. You have many customers. Lots of customers buy different the same product, but each product, you know, can be bought by multiple customers. Um, not the actual, you know, physical unit, but the product itself. Um, so that's the many-to-many -many relationship. So you like literally, I've pretty much done. All right. So um, I try to keep the first lecture to about an hour because that first day is usually pretty rough for everybody. That first week's pretty rough for everybody. Uh, too much information. Um, like I said earlier, um, next week's actually the hardest topic of the semester. But that's fine. Um, now, what are you going to have to do this week? Finish doing setting up your laptops, lab one. Um, I did put out the announcement. And please actually pay attention to my announcements. Because I don't put announcements unless they actually have meaning. Um, I've been updating the instructions. Like I think I updated the instructions three times during the lab on Tuesday. All because of the Mac users, actually. <laughs> That's just what it is, right? Um, so do lab one. As far as I know, it should be pretty good now. Uh, you have until next Friday to do it. So, you know, if you have somewhere else to be tonight, that's cool. Um, if you have problems, you know where to find me. I've actually posted the class times, I think, in, the, uh, in here. If not, I will be shortly. Um, also, um, you should start on hybrid one. They actually have due dates. Um, it's a really crappy way to lose 10% of your grade if you don't do them. So if you look at the calendar for the course, you'll see where everything is. The due dates are all in the calendar already for the entire semester. Like you can see where everything is. Um, and just so you guys, uh, see where things are at, how the grade breakdown is, I wanted to actually cover that earlier and I forgot to hit the button. You can see what the break, I can show you guys, if you guys really want to know what the breakdown of the weights for the grades are. You'll notice that lab nine's worth 15% instead of 11. And lab one's worth less because, well, you're installing a database. You're not actually learning anything, you're just suffering. Um, especially if you're on a Mac. Do you, you think I hate Macs? I don't. I hate their operating system. But I don't hate the hardware. I just, it's they just make it so hard to do anything. Um, so there's the breakdown of how all the labs are. So essentially each lab's worth about 12%, just, just so you know. Um, then you got the hybrids. Each high well they're worth 12 percent of the whatever and then each hybrid is you know grand total I, i'm already done lecturing um which is another reason why i record my lectures <laughs> there's an exact point in case and actual fact i need to Remember to cut you out walking in front of the camera. Yeah, it's not that. Is I actually have to have written permission to to have your name because I post on YouTube. So I just got to remember to cut you out. So yeah, um, so that was how the final grade breakdown were, and then you got the the the, the whole thing. So that's what the grade book looks like for me. So that's your percentages. When I, earlier I was saying like Lab Nine's worth a little more. It's worth like you know three percent of the forty percent more. So it's worth like one and a half points more than the rest towards your final grade. Okay. Um, without further ado, that's pretty much it, folks. Um, does anybody have any questions? And don't be shy to interrupt me when I'm lecturing if you don't understand something. I plan my lectures to be, I got you, just, I, I know you're there. I plan my lectures so there's a lot of buffer in case there's a lot of questions. If there's not a lot of questions, we all get to bail early, right? So it goes both ways. Yeah.
course it is. All right, let me just stop recording and I'll go fix that.